Because even if I say something, no one will listen. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Debo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in your neighborhood, come on by and join us. Especially on Fridays, we sometimes have uh, breakfast cooked for us by our resident chef, Manny, which is always a blessing. So <clears throat> today we are in the book of First Timothy. So if you want to grab your Bible, pen your pencil and highlighter, go ahead and do so. A cup of coffee and we'll get into it. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies that are fresh and in you every morning, Lord. And Lord, we're praying that you would just minister to us as we begin our day. Lord, that you give us direction and insight to your scriptures, but maybe insight to our day and insight into the decisions that we are hoping to make, Father, about our lives and about situations, Father. We ask for grace and mercy today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy. We are in chapter 5. Chapter 5. All right. Chapter 4, we, we talked about false teachers, guys who will come into the church and try to deceive uh, church members and draw them away. And then we ended with Paul encouraging uh, Timothy to not neglect the gift that God had given him as a young pastor in the church. Now he goes on and says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Now he's talking about respecting one another here, right? Especially the elderly. Especially the elderly. This is important, guys. This is really important for us. Uh, as people, because it's not about, it's not about being right. It's not about works. It's not about the order that you may have set up. It really isn't, though those are things are important, but it's about love for one another. It really is. Uh, we have to step back and pray whether we should confront someone. We should step back and pray whether we need to enforce something. Uh, we really need to step back and, and look at the relationship above anything else. How is this going to affect our relationship? Is it going to help our relationship? Is it going to strengthen our relationship? Or is it going to destroy our relationship? Is it going to jeopardize our relationship? It's about love. It really is. Everything we do is about love. It's not just being right. And they're usually the young. The young young people are usually gung-ho about, hey, this is right. And so they, they kind of approach everything that way. Well, but this is what it says. And, you know, I don't care who you are. You know, I don't care if you're the president of the United States. This is what it says, you know, and so forth. And there's no respect or honor there. And so Paul here is talking about young Timothy as a young man, as a pastor of a church, that he himself had to respect his elders, his elder men and also the ladies that were in the church, whether they were widows or whether they were older married women, but respecting one another. And that's something that we should all really contemplate. When you approach a, a, an older person than yourself, you do it with respect because God has asked us to do that. They're older. They may be even wiser. They may have experience that you don't have in life situations. Not always, but you don't know. And so we need to respect our, our elders in you know, the Bible says in the commandments, honor your father and mother, right? And so we should honor our elders also. I think it's biblical and I think that it's, it's right. And, and we should consider them in our relationship on a daily basis. So, so as a young man, you don't, want to, you don't want to rebuke your elder. I was talking to a pastor and I was sharing with uh, him about a young man who had, had rebuked his father. <clears throat> And after the conversation was all over and talking about this situation, he says, boy, and he was a lot older than me. He says, boy, back in my day, I would never speak to my father that way. And he says, even if I was right, I would not speak to my father that way. And we've lost that. We've lost that respect. We've lost that respect for 
our fathers, our mothers, and even for our, our elders. There's a way of handling it with gentleness and meekness, and it should be handled that way, not in the sense of accusations. Accusations um, really are not for us to accuse someone else, and he's going to talk about that in a second. So now he's going to define this. What does this look like? Because um, there are widows within the church, and they were affecting the church and how the church was to uh, function, whether good or bad. And so Paul gives some guidelines for widows. Now, back then, they didn't have, you know, Social Security. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have those systems. So usually it was family that took care of you. Uh, we have that still today. If you can't qualify for welfare, then usually it's a family member, a brother or a sister, an aunt or an uncle or a grandma or a great-grandma. You hear this a lot with young kids. Where did you grow up? I lived with my great-grandma for a while. I lived with my grandma for a while. And so God still you know, uses that uh, to take care of people. But in this case, they would go to the church. And if they were widows, they would then probably stay in the church. Somehow, I don't know how. Usually churches in, at these times were started in what? Homes, right? They were in homes, and so maybe they had an extra bedroom. They added on. They had places for the widows to stay. Uh, but some were misusing uh, their liberties there. Uh, some were okay, but others were not. And so Paul gives some guidelines uh, to that. He says, honor widows who are really widows. Okay, so the first thing is, is that um, really be selective when you're honoring widows. Make sure that they're really widows and they're not, you know, playing or, or um, using the system in the sense. Uh, when I was in India, I went to a orphanage and there was, I would say about 2,000, almost 3,000 kids there. <clears throat> they could hold 7,000. <clears> and we were talking about how the kids get there because they're all orphans. But they're not necessarily orphans. Sometimes uh, they have family, of some, an uncle, you know, an aunt or something like that, but they can't take care of them. But he did say that sometimes the parents are alive and because they can't take care of them, they give them to an aunt or uncle to give them to the place. And so they pretend like they're orphans, but they're really not orphans at all. They're just trying to use that system to take care of the kid because they can't afford to take care of the kid. And so they rather give up the kid, and so they lie to get them in there. And this is probably what was happening. You know, people are traveling all over the world, and they're coming, oh, I'm a widow. And she might have family, you know, across the, the country there, and so... You know, I'm a widow, and I need to come to the church and stay, and, you know, I need to do that. So he says, be careful. Really honor a real widow. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So if you're a widow, then the first place you should go with is your children. And this is how your children repay you for you taking care of them. Uh, that should be the first thing. And, and, and of course, respecting and honoring. And that's a hard situation to be. I really, I really believe it. I dread that day if it ever happens. I would rather be homeless, I think, at this point. <laughs> but I think it's hard because you have to respect one another when you're some, in someone's home, right? You have to respect their ownership. You have to respect your place there under their roof as a widow. Uh, you have to uh, contribute to a certain degree, uh, but you have to understand that your contributing doesn't give you necessarily rights uh, to anything but to stay there. Um, and on the other hand, the children need to understand this is my father, this is my mother, and I want them under my roof, and I need to respect their space. I, I shouldn't abuse them verbally or physically, and I need to give them their space so that they can still feel a sense of freedom because it's hard. Uh, they feel trapped. They feel alone. They feel useless. They feel they've lost everything. And these are feelings that are real that they go through. And so if you can give them as much freedom as possible, that will help them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the, the family, the kids, you know, now may feel that now they're taking up space. They're in a room. You know, they may need to take care of them in certain situations, which takes time, which takes effort. So there's a lot of mechanics to it all. It's just a hard thing to do, very difficult to do. Uh, 
And so Paul is saying that should be the first place, though, for widows to go. Now, she who is really a widow and left alone, trusting God, and continues in, supply, in supplications and prayers day and night. So obviously, you don't walk away from the Lord or your Christianity. You continue to be a Christian, and you pray. <clears throat> you just pray to God day and night. But she who lit, and of course, you pray for your needs, right? Lord, you need to you know, provide for me somehow. Again, they had no systems back here. So they end up living on the streets, out in a tree, under a rock, you know, somewhere. Uh, and they prayed and asked God to somehow find them a place to stay, food to eat. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives or indulgences. In other words, if you walk away from the Lord and you just decide, well, then I'm going to, you know, uh, figure out how to take care of myself. And just like today, some people that don't have family and can't take care of themselves, can't work, they'll go work and do something else. They'll become a stripper. They'll become a prostitute. They'll deal drugs. And it's all in that I need to take care of my family. I need to eat. And so I'm doing these illegal things so that I can uh, eat. But these are also pleasures too at the same time to indulge, so that they would indulge themselves. So don't walk away from the Lord. These things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so if a person has the ability uh, to go out and work and, and is lazy and does not do so, they're worse than an unbeliever. That's not a good situation to be in. We are to be hard workers. We are to um, take every opportunity to, to work. As when I was a little kid, my parents weren't wealthy. And so my mom says, go cut someone's lawn. And that's what I did. I cut someone's lawn. My neighbor didn't like doing their lawn, so I cut their lawn for $5, front and back. And I got $5 to cut their lawn. And then I would get another lawn or go wash cars. Uh, I remember uh, there was a guy here that lived in Sky Country. And that's what he would do. He'd have his bucket, he'd have his sponge, he'd have his towel, and he'd walk door to door. Hey, you want me to wash your car for $5? And he'd just go house to house, washing cars. And he made good money, he said. Really good money, because a lot of people just let him wash cars. Let me use your water hose, I got the soap, and I'll just, I'll just wash it and dry it, you know? Now, that is a great idea. You know, it, was, it wasn't an automobile, but he was walking while he was doing it, or he had a bike, you know? But that's the way of taking care of. I remember my pastor, at the time, uh, the church wasn't doing well, so he needed to find another job. So he was delivering papers. He figured, I can deliver papers. And so he went out early in the morning and throwing papers on, the, on people's lawns, and it gave him enough income to, to compensate. So there's plenty for us to do if we really want to. But some people are just lazy and don't want to. It's, it's be better if I just sit around and do nothing. You know, um, I go to the gym, been more lately now because I'm feeling better. <clears throat> and I watch the guys that check everybody in. <clears throat> and some of them aren't there to check them in. And, and then you find them and they're up at the top and they're wiping things down or they're picking up stuff and they're, you know. They're, but there's this one guy that, that when you walk in, he's in the chair and he's got his, his, his phone on and he's just... The whole time, I'll be there for, you know, usually around an hour at the, at the most. Uh, but people are checking, and he goes, hey, good morning. <laughs> he just, you know, and then when I leave, he's still there. Goodbye. <laughs> he's there the whole time just doing that, you know. And that's not taking initiative. That's not really working. You know, he's doing his job in checking people in, I'm sure, but I'm sure he has other responsibilities. And, and we as Christians should outshine everyone else because we serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he says here that if you have that ability, then you're worse than a unbeliever if you do not take care of your family. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken <clears throat> into the number and not under, unless the, she has been the wife of one man. Uh, well reported for good works if she has brought up children, if she has longed, uh, lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, now, this is the only place that we see washing saints' feet. I, I found this interesting because I remember one time a uh, brother teaching from uh, <clears throat> John chapter uh, 13 where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. <clears throat> and uh, there are churches today that do that regularly as part of their service. They do a, a foot washing 
or feet washing. I don't know which one's correct to say. And, and so they make that a part of their service to teach us humility, you know, and loving for one another. And they, they say, we're just doing what Jesus did. But they, they do it to a point where they say everyone should be doing it. But that's not the case, right? Because Jesus never said, do this now until I come back. You know, it's not a command to wash each other's feet. And nowhere in the scriptures did it command us by any of the apostles to wash each other's feet. But some of them were doing it, you know. And so here, apparently, Paul is saying, look, if she has this characteristic as, as a widow, then this is good. If she was a, a hospitable, if she worked and she did, you know, washing people's feet. So apparently they were washing people's feet still. And maybe Jesus' example there was taken too literally you know, for some at the time. He's not saying that we should do this, but it's just evident of her character that she's worthy to be in the church and taken care of. If she has uh, relieved and the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, but refused the younger widow, for when they have begun to grow wanting against Christ, they desire to marry. Um, Interesting what he's saying there, wanting against Christ. He's saying was, and you remember Corinthians, we just went through chapter 7, right? And Paul's whole purpose was, look, if, if you're free, you get to serve the Lord that much more without any concerns for someone else. You're free to do that. And so what he's saying here is, look, when a young person comes in, they're, they're going to uh, have wanting for Christ. In other words, they're going to they're gonna put Christ second because now I need to be married. I have this desire to have a husband. I want a husband. And there are a lot of ladies like that that are looking for husbands. They want someone to take care of them, to love them. Companionship. That's one of the biggest, the biggest things is companionship. People are looking for companionship. It's interesting how relationships are. Um, you're married and oftentimes you don't have companionship. There's really no no deep communication at all. There's, there's no um, relationship there uh, of any sort that's, that's, um, that's one of companionship. I'm not talking about sexuality. I'm talking about just being friends and companionship. And then you see singles and you hear oftentimes or women that are divorced <clears throat> or they're widows and it's about companionship. It's about having someone else to talk to. And it's not about sexuality at all. It's just about having someone to talk to about issues of life and living life and so forth. And so they go wanting. They want that friendship. And so Paul here is saying that if, you, if she's too young, be careful because she's probably going to end up wanting a husband and then she'll be, be leaving uh, the church there and wanting to get married. <clears throat> having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossip and busybodies, saying things which they ought not to. Now, we all know what that is, right? That's stuff that goes on in the church all the time. It shouldn't go on in the church, and I hope it doesn't go on in, in the church. And if we catch ourselves, we should correct ourselves and not become busybodies and not become gossipers. Uh, it only hurts and destroys uh, people's character. It's character. And I don't, I don't, you know, Paul isn't saying just widows here. He mentions gossip in other places too. So it's not just against widows. It's not just against homeless people. It's not against just men and it's not against just women. It's, it's all of us. We should not be gossiping. We should not be in people's business, you know, stay out of people's business. Sometimes someone will come up to me and say, you know, so-and-so, I go, that's not my business. That's their business. And it shouldn't be your business. Um, if you think it's your business, uh, it's not. You don't live with them. You don't know all the details. Um, you don't know what's going on. Um, and oftentimes we're making our judgment calls based upon what we think we see when we don't really know what we see at all. Um, there's so many examples of that. Uh, you make a decision and then you end up finding out later, ooh, that wasn't really what was going on. Uh, I wish I would have known that back then. So he, he makes it very clear here that younger women, and he's just giving us an observation, and I think it's a good observation. I don't know, ladies, if you notice that or not, but younger women have that tendency uh, he didn't say men, but he said women here, and he's talking about widows. Do men do it? I'm sure they do. I'm not saying they're excluded from that. But women do, and it's known scientifically that they love to talk a lot more than men. 
you know, and they can go from one subject to the next subject uh, very quickly and very easily and without missing a beat. And you can't get a word in, in wise. You try to find that little gap, that little breath. And when you try to get in there, they just go on and, you know, I'll speak you. And so you just have to sit there and listen and nod your head and so forth. But a man, and you know this, I'm not saying anything you don't know. A man will sit there and not say a word to you at all and be content at that. And you can ask them, so how was your day? It was good. Thanks for asking. You ask a woman, how was your day? Well, I started off with this. And then it goes on and 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 on. And next thing you know, she's talking about the future, you know, and what she's going to be doing then. And it's like, I just asked how your day was, you know. <laughs> and it's just a fact. And it happens. And so Paul's saying, be careful. Again, because they have a tendency of doing that. Therefore, I know I'm getting in trouble here, people on Facebook. <laughs> but God loves you, and it's his word, and I'm only repeating what Paul said. So, he goes on, and he says in verse 14, Therefore I desire that the younger uh, widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak uh, reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. So there were some bad things going on here. Now, Paul isn't contradicting himself from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he said, look, if, if you're a widow, stay a widow. It's better. But if you need to marry, then marry. He's not contradicting himself. He's saying, look, if this widow that's a busybody that's going around, blah, 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 she probably needs to get married. <laughs> she needs to get married. She needs to have children and she needs to focus her, her efforts on taking care of her husband and taking care of her children and taking care of her own business and no one else's business. And otherwise, Satan gets in there and he destroys, he causes division. And that's what happens when you become busybodies. It's just amazing how you can divide a church so quickly, a family so quickly, by people becoming busybodies. Um, got so many examples, but can't share them. Um, <clears throat> if any believing man or woman has widows, let him relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. So, we should respect our elders very clearly, just as we respect our mother and fathers. Um, we should respect our elders also, whether widows or whether they're men or women. There's a certain respect. There was a, a guy here that, that was a lot older than me. Uh, I'm not going to say his name because you would all know who he is because he's in our community. <clears throat> But he was a lot older than me, and I made sure that uh, as a person that was under me as, as leadership, that I made sure, though, that I respected him whenever I could, uh, whenever there was a disagreements and so forth. And it finally came to a point where, where um, some situation came up, and his wife wanted to know if this was true or not. And at that point, I was getting tired of having to deal with with situations all the time so i i just respectfully just says yeah you're he's right i just <laughs> yeah he's right okay well we'll be leaving the church i go okay god bless you guys it was one of those blessed subtractions it was one of those blessed subtractions you know um i always are leery when someone comes in no matter what age and they come in and they say this i, I pastor i want you to know i understand submission i was in the military uh, and i know what submission means and so i am totally submitted to you and that's like a, a warning flag to me. To me, it's like, Pastor, I understand what it means. I was in the military, but I struggle with it. That's what they're really telling me. Because down the road, they end up having a struggle with submission. You know, so the best thing to do is just live it. You know, you don't have to say it. Just live it out, and in time, it, it will always be there. You won't have to say anything, right? Because your character's there. Now he moves on to to elders. Uh, so respect, you know, older men, older women, uh, widows, and now respect your elders, that is your pastors. So Paul's kind of writing to Timothy here, and he says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. Now, I want you to notice something here. Um, double honor for those who labor in what? Word and doctrine, right? Double honor. So there is an honor, and that honor is, you know, you don't accuse them of anything. You, you don't correct them of anything. Now, I know I'm sounding like, don't correct me, don't come against me. I'm not 
saying that at all. There's a way of doing that. But I'm trying to give you an idea of what Paul is saying here. If there's an honor there for your elders, women and, and men and widows, and there's an honor there for your pastor, what does double honor look like? <laughs> that means really honor them, double the amount, which how can you double something when it's already pretty pretty solid. So what he's saying is and emphasizing is, look, don't don't even come against them like Korah, like Aaron, like Miriam. You know, give them double honor because they are in the word and doctrine. They didn't say because of their way of running the church, by the way. They didn't say that. Or by the way they make decisions. They didn't say that. If they're faithful in word and doctrine, that's enough. They might have a lack of skills and leadership, you know? Maybe they don't lead as well as someone else does and they're doing the best they can from what they know and they tried and they learn. So that's not disqualifying them from the double honor. What's disqualifying them is they're not in the word or doctrine. That's what disqualifying them. So honor them because they're in the word and because they're teaching the scriptures to you. And then he says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The labor is worthy of his wages. So apparently, um, some were probably trying to keep Timothy from receiving any wages. You know, while he's too young, you know, let's not give him wages. Um, let's be careful there. It's interesting that, and Chuck kind of started this. Um, he tests people. He would test people, you know, to see if they're called or not. And he'd say, come on to the ministry. And he, he wouldn't really, you know, I, and I don't know how much he paid, but talking to some of the guys that started with him, you know, like Mike McIntosh just at the conference, he said, what was it, Randy? He said, like, I got $75 a, a week or a month, whatever it was, something like that. He goes, it was hardly nothing. And I had to trust in God. And I think, you know, he said, I thank Chuck that he did that because it, it really helped me to trust in God, that God was going to be my provider. So I understand that. But at the same time, you know, Paul here says, look, if you have a labor that's uh, in the word and in scriptures, then you're supposed to uh, take care of them. You're supposed to take care of them. Uh, you don't withhold from them. Um, I remember years ago uh, when I went full time, there was one board member. And one of the things that Virginia wanted was life insurance. Because if I happened to pass without it and her never working, who's going to take care of her? And I'll give you some examples. There's been a couple of pastors, pastors here. Uh, one lady that we know very well, personally, pastored right over here in Creekside. Her husband passed with no insurance. And she had nothing. And she has been struggling just to survive. And so there's examples of that. And now the, another pastor, his wife, uh, he, he passed away. And he had insurance. And she's taken care of very well. Very well. So Virginia wanted to do that. I would have probably said, oh, you know, no problem, we won't have it. But Virginia was like, no, I'm the one that's going to suffer. <laughs> you know, so, so I said, okay, so I'll bring it before the board. And one of the, one of the board members was like, I don't have it, so why should you? You know, so that was the attitude. You know, I'm like, wow, okay, so whatever you don't have, I guess I, I shouldn't have then. That, because that's your logic. That's your logic. You know, so that's how he based his, um, his decision making, was based upon what he had. <clears throat> and fortunately, the other board members agreed, and so it was voted to, to give us life insurance. So, if you have a pastor that is teaching the word and doctrine well, you know, you need to take care of him. I'm just telling you what Paul's saying here, guys. I'm not asking for a raise, by the way. <laughs> <clears throat> Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. So here's where you, you correct an elder. Okay, so you see something. And so you stop and you say, okay, well, I see it. I'm wondering if anyone else sees it. I think I'm just going to pray about this and wait for the Lord. And then someone else may come up to you and say, hey, did you see that? Yeah, I kind of saw that. Now you have two witnesses. So let's, let's approach him. Pastor, this is something we just noticed. We're not coming against you. We just want to keep it between us. And this is what's going on. We love you to death. You know, we're hoping that you can, you know, work with us on this. Teach us, show us something that we can... Maybe we're not seeing something. And you approach it, and hopefully he'll, he'll humble himself, you know, and say, you're right, that's an area that I struggle with. I love it when people do that. I, I love it completely. Somebody uh, commented, you know, uh, 
I won't mention her name because she's here, but she uh, she corrects my my spelling, and and she was correcting me, and someone actually saw her correcting me, and afterwards it was all done. They came up to me and they said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. I really appreciated the way you received that. Wow, if it was me, I would have gotten all prideful and blah blah blah. I'm like, hey. You know what? I'm a lousy speller and I'm a lousy person with grammar. So if someone wants to correct me, hey, I'm open to it because I don't want it that witness there for week after week after week after week. Let's get it corrected and then no one will know I'm a lousy speller and a lousy grammar person. So I appreciate it. I don't have an issue with it. And, and that goes with <coughs> any other subjects. The subjects that I do struggle with is when they're wrong. And then I tell them they're wrong, and now they get offended. It's like, well, no, I'm not wrong. And now it becomes, you know, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I had a guy tell me, you're prideful. And I'm like, no, I'm not prideful in the situation that you're, you're dealing with. I'm not prideful. Yes, you are. Now you're saying you don't get pride. No, I didn't say I don't get pride. You know, but that's when it becomes a confrontation. When I, when I say, no, I, I agree that that happens, but that's not the case here. And so you should be able to receive that also. But we're really past time, so let's finish up. <laughs> Sorry. So those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect, and, and the elect that, that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily or share in other people's sin. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. He's not saying drink. He's just saying this was the kind of medicine to comfort your stomach and soothe it. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So what Paul is saying here, when you're going to accuse a pastor, you know, realize this, that, that some will get caught right now, but some will get caught later because they'll stand before God because God sees everything. So he is the ultimate judge. So you can be assured, if you see something and you know something and there's no other evidence of it, just wait on the Lord. The Lord will reveal it. The Lord will reveal it. Or in time, the Lord will judge him on it at the end times. So either way, you know, it, it will get corrected by the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. There's so much there, Lord. Uh, and then just thank you, Father, for the, the instructions, Father, that you have given us as a church and how we ought to function, Father. How, again, how love needs to be, be the, the issue and the center of every situation, Lord. It has to be, Lord. Otherwise, we're doing it in our own strength and our own flesh and without God. Because God is so concerned for the pastor. God is so concerned for the widow. God is so concerned for the elderly man or woman, Lord. He loves them very deeply. And he's concerned for them, Lord. And I pray that we understand that, Father, in every situation, that God is concerned for that one person. And if we don't understand that and we take care of those things in, in a deceiving way, God will take care of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for watching. If you don't have a church, I pray that you will consider us. Uh, look at our website at ccinland.org. And if you have any prayer requests, please post them. And we'll pray for you as we're praying in a moment here. Or private message me and I'll pray for you privately if you want me to. Or we'll pray here for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.